we will leave questions till the end. So please keep them coming through the chat and I'm taking notes. And yes, we are eager to hear Mark Lowe's talk about pancreatic diseases in children. Okay, thank you very much, Maisam. Um, and I'm covering a rather broad topic, so uh, I may move a little quickly, but let's see where we go. Um, only conflict is I am on an advisory board for the CF Foundation. And today I'm going to use a classification that's a little bit arbitrary um, and talk about con the, the pancreatic disorders, uh, which is uh, chronic pancreatitis that Chris was just talking about would fall into. But the congenital disorders uh, uh, always present uh, in childhood. So these con uh, uh, congenital disorders can take the broad classifications of ductal abnormalities, defects in migration, which I'll explain, uh, functional abnormalities of the pancreas, and disorders of pancreatic volume. To understand these, we first need to review a little bit of the embryology of the pancreas. So when the pancreas starts to form uh, along the foregut, which becomes your intestine, intestinal tract, there are two buds. There's a ventral analog or bud and a dorsal analog or bud. And during uh, development, there's a rotation that brings the ventral analog over, uh, next to the dorsal analog. And there is fusion of these two analogs. And the, the duct that's in the ventral uh, analog fuses with the duct of uh, the dorsal analog to form the main pancreatic duct most of the time. The, the part of the dorsal duct that is uh, not involved in forming the main pancreatic duct uh, sometimes stays a patent, which we'll talk about, but off, most of the time uh, just uh, becomes fibrotic and, and uh, disappears. So this process, uh, things go awry in this process uh, can lead to, oops, got to do the wrong thing here, uh, some ductal element, uh, abnormalities. The first that I'm going to talk about is uh, pancreas divisum, uh, which is seen in up to 7% of uh, patients. And that's when the two ducts failure, fail to fuse. And the Dorsal duct continues to drain from the minor papilla that uh, Chris showed you in his video, and the ventral duct fuses through the uh, normal papilla. That's shown here on an MRCP, and this is the, what's called a crossing sign, where you see the pancreatic duct cross over the common bile duct, and this is the patient with pancreas divisum. Whether or not pancreas divisum is a true uh, disease, I think is controversial. Uh, the best evidence is that it is, seems to be increased in kids who have uh, chronic pancreatitis, but it, that may not be the case in adults. If the process doesn't uh, occur properly, um, I'll go back once And this, you see the common bile duct normally joins the, the pancreatic duct near the, the opening in the duodenum. Sometimes this doesn't happen and the common bile duct joins uh, the pancreatic duct uh, further upstream so that there's what's the, a long common channel uh, shown in this diagram and also shown in this MRCP. So this is where the, uh, the, the, the main pancreatic duct joins the, um, uh, the duodenum. And so there's a long common channel. And this can lead uh, to obstruction, increased incidence of pancreatitis, and sometimes is associated with another, another anomaly, uh, uh, which is dilation of the common bile duct that's called a, a colidocal cyst or a colidocus. So they can, they can occur together. And these do increase your risk for developing episodes of uh, recurrent pancreatitis. So that's called an anomalous pancreatic uh, biliary union. Um, sometimes during this rotation, uh, the fusion occurs abnormally and the pancreas ends up wrapped around the duodenum. This is called an annular pancreas. It's fairly uncommon. It's only one in three out of uh, 20,000 people. It can present in various ways, including intestinal obstruction, pancreatitis, and duodenal ulceration, and uh, requires uh, surgery uh, to repair. Although there are people who uh, have this uh, and live a full life without having problems. Uh, another um, defect of migration is called an eptopic pancreas. So sometimes you'll get pieces of pancreatic tissue um, in other locations. The most common is uh, common place is the stomach, as shown here. This is the pylorus, so the opening to the small intestine, and this is a classic appearance of an ectopic pancreas. Um, 
with this little dimple in the middle. And uh, if, under, if you could biopsy underneath, uh, you could find pancreatic tissue, which is submucosal. So the layer looks like uh, stomach because it is gastric layer. This occurs in one to 2% of people. And most of the time it's asymptomatic and, and found uh, when you're doing an upper endoscopy for another reason. Although rarely they can lead to obstruction, uh, sometimes can bleed, and there have very rarely been reports of uh, pancreatic cancer developing an ectopic, ectopic uh, pancreas. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about functional abnormalities. And I've divided those into the ones that cause fatty replacement of the pancreas and ones that cause fibrosis. So the one, and all of these are related to uh, genetic defects, either uh, known mutations in, in uh, specific genes. One, uh, Pearson marrow pancreas syndrome is due to uh, breakdown of DNA that are in your mitochondria. So DNA is not just in the nucleus of the cell, the mitochondria have their own DNA. And this leads to something called per, uh, Pearson marrow pancreas syndrome. June syndrome, Johansson blizzard syndrome are also uh, seen. The one of these that's most common is Schwachmann diamond syndrome, which I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. Um, but all of these are, are quite rare, but Schwachmann diamond is the most common. So, as I said, you see a fatty pancreas, and that is shown in this CT scan of a patient with Schwachmann diamond. So, normally the pancreas is, a, is grayscale, something like the, the liver is shown here, and fat uh, is dark. And so, this pancreas is mostly replaced. Uh, with fatty tissue. Uh, they also have uh, uh, <clears throat> defects in blood cells, most commonly neutrophils, which are a blood cell, but it can occur in any of the, uh, the, the blood cells. And in fact, uh, this has become a, a disease more of hematologists than uh, pancreatologists uh, in the recent years because of the, the risk for developing precancerous syndromes and, and blood cancers. These children are typically shorter, although they can be within normal range. So this is just a growth curve with the blue dots showing uh, normal curves, third, 50th, and 97th percentile. The red lines are for Schwachmann diamond. So you can see that they're shifted downward. Although some children with Schwachmann diamond syndrome will uh, track nicely along the normal growth curves. Uh, skeletal uh, abnormalities, um, particularly in the joints, uh, are also quite common in, the, in uh, Schwachmann diamond uh, uh, syndrome. The uh, disorders of pancreatic volume uh, in, in include two things, the pancreatic agenesis, where the pancreas doesn't form well. So this is a pa uh, CT of a patient that just has the pancreatic head. The rest of the pancreas, which should fill this space, is gone and missing. So that's pancreatic agenesis. Sometimes the entire pancreas is missing. Um, and uh, those patients require uh, very aggressive therapy with enzyme replacement and insulin therapy. Um, and although uh, with proper management, those children do survive. Uh, pancreatic cysts, uh, which most of us think about forming um, after an episode of pancreatitis can actually be congenital. This is a, uh, and oftentimes quite large, uh, which this one is. Uh, they're treated surgically. Uh, with the newer, uh, particularly ultrasound transducers that are much more sensitive, we're seeing many more kids who have uh, very small uh, cysts in their pancreas. These can be associated with um, diseases like von uh, Hippel-Lindau uh, uh, syndrome, uh, polycystic kidney disease, um, uh, but oftentimes are, are isolated. And uh, even if you follow them with time, they don't uh, progress uh, and become larger. Uh, children that are usually will present, an the ones with large congenital cysts will present in infancy. This particular patient also had a lot of ascites at the time of present presentation. Now, um, I'd like to, to spend the rest of my time talking about the inflammatory disorders, which are most uh, more common. Um, acute pancreatitis is a, an inflammatory disorder of the pancreas. Yeah, that is, uh, in most patients, occurs one time. So pancreas, uh, acute pancreatitis, I like to think of as an event. Whereas chronic pancreatitis that uh, Chris just talked to you about is a process that develops uh, over time to lead uh, to the complications that he, that he comes to. And what you're going to hear, uh, you, you just heard about a little bit about chronic pancreatitis, and you'll hear more about chronic pancreatitis if you join some of the later seminars, webinars. But uh, what I'd like to do is highlight some of the things that are different about these disorders in children. 
Um, just like adults, um, the histology, the uh, acute pancreatitis comes in two types. The most common is interstitial. So this is a normal pancreas. This is a, a pancreas with uh, acute pancreatitis where you can see more white spaces. You see uh, inflammatory cells, um, uh, dying cells. Uh, but overall, the, uh, the acinar cells are present. A more serious type of uh, acute pancreatitis is necrotizing pancreatitis, where you lose a lot of the, uh, the pancreatic acinar cells. Uh, there's one that's not very happy here. There's, in this patient, there's uh, hemorrhage or blood cells. So this is hemorrhagic ne necrosis. Um, but both of these types uh, occur in children as they do in adults. And the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis in children is it's really the same as in adults. It requires two out of three criteria. So you need pain that's uh, compatible with pancreatic origin, which is typically epigastric, although in younger kids, uh, they may complain of more generalized pain. Uh, the pain may radiate to the back, although that I think is less common in children than adults. Um, <clears throat> uh, nausea and vomiting can be part of the, the presentation with kids. And, and um, this is, although this is a, an adult, uh, kids do assume what, uh, what can be the jackknife position and they can have all, all different uh, variations of this. Um, the kids can get into positions that it would uh, take a, um, a, a, uh, a forklift to get me uh, out of if I try to get in them. Uh, but they do, uh, the, the point is, is that they, they, they try to, to, to assume a position that we think because the pancreas is retroperitoneal, uh, sort of moves the pancreas away from the, the peritoneum and, and decreases some of the pain. But this is, uh, you see this very often in kids, this position. Um, the second criteria is an amylase or lipase or both that are three times the upper reference limit. And this is a study of 369 uh, pediatric patients that were at St. Louis Children's Hospital. And if you looked at them, a few uh, only had amylase, uh, a few only had lipase alone, and the bulk had uh, both uh, uh, enzymes elevated. Um, although if you just measure one or the other, it's been advocated to just measure lipase alone, uh, you may miss a few patients who just have uh, amylase uh, elevated at the time. So both uh, need to be up. And then uh, imaging features of acute pancreatitis. <clears throat> um, uh, which can be common. This is a, uh, a pa an ultrasound of a patient who has an edematous uh, uh, pancreas that is heterogeneous uh, in echogenicity. Uh, there's peripancreatic fluid. Uh, this is also a, a, a patient that has an a CT scan of a patient with an edematous pancreas and what's called uh, peripancreatic fat stranding. So there's oftentimes some uh, abdominal fat around the pancreas and if that gets inflamed, you can see this uh, uh, stranding. So these are also uh, quite useful. In children, uh, we tend to do a lot of ultrasounds uh, and fewer CT scans. Um, but one of the issues you run into with ultrasound is that uh, intestinal gas can get in the way and you may not get a good uh, view of, of, the, um, of the pancreas. And also using a CT scan with IV contrast is a much better way to diagnose ne necrotizing pancreatitis. So if you're suspicious of necrotizing pancreatitis, then your CT scan is better. Interestingly, one of the things that we've learned about childhood pancreatitis is that uh, the diagnosis has increased over the years. So this is from uh, data from uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And in the early 90s, there were just a few cases of uh, acute pancreatitis diagnosed. In fact, in those two years, if you looked at new cases, uh, there were none in 91 and 92. These were all patients who'd had previous episodes of acute pancreatitis. And this uh, had trend had been going up, which has been seen in, in multiple institutions. Uh, it, it, this ends at 2004, but the, the number has remained fairly steady then. But in around 1999 uh, is when we first uh, recognized that more and more kids seem to be diagnosed with childhood pancreatitis. And the question is, is the incidence really increasing or, or are we just uh, more aware of what's happening? And so one way to look at that is just look at the number of amylase uh, <clears throat> or lipase tests measured each year uh, versus the number of patients diagnosed with acute pancreatitis each year. And one can see that there's a very good linear correlation between the two. So uh, suggesting that uh, physicians were becoming more aware of uh, 
of uh, acute pancreatitis in, that could happen in children and the diagnosis was made. Um, now I suspect in earlier years, many of these kids were sent home with a virus. The etiology of acute pancreatitis in childhood varies from that in adults. Uh, uh, alcohol is, is not a common um, etiology as it is in adults, but just like adults, biliary pancreatitis is very common. This is data from the United States and a data from a uh, study in Korea where about uh, almost 30% of the children uh, with acute pancreatitis had uh, gallstone disease or other biliary disease, mostly gallstone disease. Uh, medications. Uh, mostly uh, chemotherapeutics, anticonvulsants are quite common. Um, and systemic disease is another fairly common uh, category. And trauma, if you'd looked at papers in the late 80s, uh, trauma would have been considered 40 or 50 percent. Um, and I think that's simply because uh, a lot of kids who had acute pancreatitis in the late 80s were never diagnosed. Um, but biliary disease uh, medications are very common. and uh, but we still have a, a fair number of children where we don't have a clear etiology. The etiology does uh, vary by age. Biliary disease uh, stays fairly steady across ages. Um, idiopathic is uh, more common in, the, in older kids than in kids from zero to two. Uh, kids from zero to two are more likely to have trauma or systemic disease as their cause, uh, whereas older kids are a little more likely to have medication. Uh, as their cause and less likely to have uh, trauma or systemic disease as causes. So the etiology does vary a bit by disease, uh, although there's a lot of uh, overlap. The clin clinical presentation also varies by age. Uh, old children, uh, infants and toddlers uh, divide up to age three and children three and above. Um, they present very much like adults where vomiting is common, abdominal pain is very common. As I said, back pain is, is only a, a less than 10%. Um, and the present presenting symptom for infants and toddlers can be vomiting and abdominal pain. Uh, irritability in nonverbal kids uh, may indicate abdominal pain, so they may be very common. But what's interesting is that the, patient, the, the parents brought the child to, the, to a, uh, medical attention in, in, uh, fee, for fever in 43% and a distended abdomen in 16%, uh, which were complaints that are not uh, commonly seen in older uh, children. So one needs to be mindful that infants and toddlers can have acute pancreatitis and may present differently. Treatment of acute pancreatitis is uh, supportive care, IV hydration at presentation. Um, <clears throat> usually uh, most people advocate more aggressive uh, hydration in the first 24 to 48 hours, although the data in children are uh, still uh, to be in development. And then obviously you want to identify and treat etiologies that are treated. If they have gallstones, you want to treat that. If you can identify a medication that's a cause, you need to take that off. Um, some of the, sometimes you don't find the etiology and, and they need to get through. Um, treatment also involves uh, pain control and adequate train, pain control is important. Um, the kids often uh, look pretty pretty healthy and normal and don't look like they're sick. Um, and some oftentimes uh, the amount of pain that they have uh, isn't appreciated by the medical staff. Uh, nutritional support, um, the days of uh, keeping the, the kids without any nutrition for days on end uh, for prolonged episodes of acute pancreatitis are over. And we usually try to start it in the first 24 to 48 hours, although sometimes uh, you start a little bit later than that. Uh, most kids can eat by mouth. You rarely need to use enteral feedings in kids. Um, and then you want to monitor, monitor for complications. So this is a uh, cyst that we talked about, a fluid collection that is a result of acute pancreatitis. This is not congenital. This was a, 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 um, developed. You, one can see it's compressing the stomach and it's quite likely that uh, this uh, cyst will need to be uh, drained uh, at some point in time. So, but you need to be mindful that complications do develop in kids. Um, now I'd like to move on to chronic pancreatitis in children. Uh, once again, this is a normal pancreas. These are the islets that uh, Dr. Forsmark was talking about. Um, and this is uh, chronic pancreatitis with fibrosis. Once again, these are islets. And as Dr. Forsmark said, they, they, with time, they will uh, start to also go away. But one can see they're very, you don't, usually don't see them this close together. And that's because you see very, you see almost no acinar tissue. There's a few uh, stray acinar cells in this uh, sample, but most of this is just scar tissue. So that's the histology that Dr. Forsmark referred to, same in, in kids. 
Uh, the body can be damaged. I think this may be the, very similar to the CT scan Dr. Forsmark said, but I, I put it in here on purpose because I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that we don't see calcifications in kids very often. As Dr. Forsmark said, they can take a while to develop. Um, and, uh, but the main point is, is that the body, uh, the pancreas is damaged uh, and calcifications can be one way. Endoscopic ultrasound that Dr. Forsmark also talked about is being used more and more in kids. Um, I think the, uh, there are some limitations with smaller kids because of the size of the scopes, um, but uh, that will change with time. So we do do more of that in children. Um, as I said, before Mark said, the pancreatic duct is damaged. This is a, a normal pancreatic duct and a normal ERCP. Uh, the duct can be quite dilated. We see this in kids, just as you can see it in children. Uh, this is by a dilated duct by MRCP. One could also see lots of side branches coming off the duct, which is abnormal. Um, this is a dilated duct by CT and a dilated duct by endoscopic ultrasound. So there are many ways to look at this. And this is a fairly common finding in kids who uh, develop chronic pancreatitis. Kids also have loss of function, exocrine dysfunction, uh, once again, the inability to digest food, endocrine dysfunction, the diabetes mellitus type 3C um, that uh, Dr. Forsmark mentioned, uh, it appears later than pancreatic insufficiency in general. Although we do see uh, children who have uh, diabetes that are thought to be related to chronic pancreatitis. And kids, um, as Dr. Forsmark alluded to, um, the etiology is frequently related to one of those genetic risk factors. So this is a comparison with the NAPS2 study that Dr. Forsmark mentioned. So these are adults, these are kids. One can see that genetic factors are two thirds, uh, and I think it's gonna be close to three quarters of kids. Obstructive fact, uh, causes, uh, some of the things that we talked about, usually congenital things like the anomalous insertion. Uh, bio, uh, uh, common bile duct is, uh, uh, something we see toxic metabolic uh, is much less common in uh, kids and adults, and that's mostly because smoking and alcohol would be included in that category in adults. We do see some autoimmune disease, but the main takeaway is that the vast majority of kids have genetic um, risk factors for uh, 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 pancreatitis. And if we look at kids, so this is a, um, over 300 kids that have had their uh, uh, the genotypes for the risk of genes done. Uh, this is hereditary pancreatitis, the one, uh, the autosomal dominance, about 30% of kids, about 30% have <clears throat> abnormalities in the uh, uh, CFTR, the CF gene, uh, SPINK1, which is a, a protease inhibitor gene that's made by the pancreas. It's about 30%. Uh, CTRC uh, is a smaller percentage, and there are other genes uh, that also make up smaller percentages, but the, the most common ones are listed here. Uh, they vary a little bit by age. So PRSS1 um, and CTRC are more likely to uh, in kids under the age of six, uh, but kids of all ages have these. Uh, and one of the, 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 the interesting things is that uh, kids seem to have a lot of a variant in the CTR, um, uh, C gene uh, called PG uh, 60 point G which will show uh, here. Uh, so this is adults. So it was found in less than 10% uh, of adults when it was almost 35% of kids uh, with uh, acute recurrent or chronic pancreatitis. It's not known. So this is, doesn't change the amino acid. So it's not, it was unclear uh, why this is linked with uh, risk, but it is a high risk uh, 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 allele or uh, haplotype. Um, the mechanism not known in the speculation is that it disrupts um, an SP1 binding site. So this is a protein that controls uh, the levels of the gene expression. Um, it, it also uh, is in linkage disequilibrium with another transcription factor, the ATF3 site that's in, uh, that may be involved. Um, and uh, so it may, it may be that it, it affects, uh, indirectly affect, is just linked to things that affect um, the, how much of this protein is made in, in kids, but it is uh, common in kids. It, one of the things that we have learned is that the time from the first uh, <clears throat> AP episode to CP is uh, fairly fast. The median is just under four years with a range of one to eight years. So from the first episode of acute pancreatitis on. But we also know that 
96% of kids who have chronic pancreatitis have multiple effort, uh, episodes of acute pancreatitis. So they have a recurrent acute pancreatitis in the four years leading up to, to clear changes and the clear diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. One of the things that Dr. Forsmark alluded to is that our uh, diagnostic criteria for chronic pancreatitis are not very sensitive, so it's quite likely some of these patients have some chronic changes that are uh, below our, our ability to det detect them with current uh, modalities. Um, uh, this shows that uh, the age uh, of the first episode of pancreatitis does affect progression. So if you were older than six years when you had your first attack of acute pancreatitis and then developed recurrent episodes, it was just under three years to develop changes, chronic changes in your pancreas. Whereas if you were younger, it was about five years to develop uh, changes uh, in the pancreas. So age, uh, that presentation uh, plays a role in progression of disease. Uh, children have a lot of burden from chronic pancreatitis, uh, pain as uh, uh, you see in uh, adults. 42% uh, uh, had uh, exocrine insufficiency, about 6%. I think we're now think that this number is going to be a little higher than this, but they have a lot of ER visits, uh, hospitalizations, and uh, many of them have constant episodes of severe pain. It's about a third of kids, uh, another third of episodes of severe pain. Um, and there are some, uh, some minority of kids have constant of severe pain. So the burden of CP is quite high in children as it is in adults. As I mentioned, CP uh, is a journey and uh, sort of summary of what uh, we've just learned is depicted in this slide. So most kids have episodes of acute um, uh, recurrent pancreatitis can be associated with abdominal pain. Uh, there's a period where they move from uh, these episodes that, that uh, they basically recover from to uh, developing changes of, uh, uh, de of definite chronic pancreatitis where these changes are an irreversible, they can develop what we can call an uncompensated stage where they have fibrosis, sclerosis, excrement insufficiency, diabetes, pain, uh, and develop a uh, risk for uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and risk for uh, malnutrition. So chronic pancreatitis in children, uh, and I think also in many adults is, uh, is a process, which also means that there is hope that we, if we can develop therapies to stop these episodes of acute pancreatitis, we could prevent uh, and stop this journey. Um, <clears throat> there are treatable etiologies of chronic pancreatitis that one must be aware of, and they're listed here. There are metabolic problems such as hypercalcemia or hyperlipidemia. Alcohol smoking are much less common medications you need to think about. Uh, there are autoimmune causes um, in, in uh, children that can be treatable. Uh, there are things that can lead to mucosal disease that can use, cause acute recurrent pancreatitis and, and lead, that can lead to chronic pancreatitis are listed here. And then there are a variety of obstructed causes, some of which that I, I talked about uh, earlier. But one needs to think of these because you, could, you can treat these early on. So in children who've had uh, a, a multi, a recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis, one needs to become more aggressive in your uh, search for etiologies. There are not so treatable etiologies. Idiopathic is still part of it. Uh, there are children who develop chronic pancreatitis after they have necro uh, necrotic acute pancreatitis. Uh, there are patients that have vascular disease or ischemic disease. And then the genetic causes right now are not treatable, although I think there's a lot of interest in, in these, particularly uh, since they're so common in kids. And this is a, a more complete list of uh, genes that have been associated with increased risk. And I think that there's hope that we will develop uh, treatments for these uh, in the in near future. Chronic pancreatitis, you heard a lot about the man uh, management. Once again, you want to identify and treat the etiology and manage the complications as discussed by Dr. Forsmark. It's the same in kids. And to finish, um, congenital pancreatic diseases uh, occur. They're most likely a di uh, dis uh, diagnosed in childhood. Uh, acute pancreatitis, the diagnosis has increased in children. Uh, the etiologies of acute pancreatitis are not the same as the etiologies in adults, and so you need to, to think of uh, a little bit differently. Um, acute recurrent or chronic pancreatitis in children is uh, predominantly genetic risk factors, and understanding how those cause disease is going to be very important in eventually treating these diseases. Uh, and that chronic pancreatitis is preceded by recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis, uh, which I think uh, gives us hope that we, we can uh, treat uh, these diseases. Uh, thank you.
Well, thank you, Mark. And thanks to both of our speakers for enlightening talks. And there are some questions on the chat bar that um, some of them Chris had answered and I'll um, read them quickly for the audience. But then there are some that we can summarize and maybe ask in the next uh, few minutes that are left. So um, one of the um, questions that came up was, if the um, reversal of fibrosis is possible once you remove the inciting factors like alcohol and smoking and it seems possible it's just catching uh, dr forsmark um alluded to the possibility and probably is, it is part of the process to catch it in the right time and this is where more research is going to know what is the right time um a common question that came and it's common between the two talks so i will ask it to dr forsmark is when would we think we would incorporate genetics workup? So in the pediatric uh, world, um, uh, we do it after the second attack. When do adult practice uh, change or has it changed to incorporate genetic workup for acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis? Yeah, Matt, I don't think there's a, um, a set guideline. I think the younger the patient at the onset, uh, the more you begin to think about it. For most of us, I think it's, uh, you know, it's after two or three or four episodes or a patient that already has established chronic pancreatitis. So we tend to think about it later, maybe too late, um, because we often find those mutations in adults just like we do in kids. But I think for most of us, you know, for the Adult above 50, we worry a lot about whether they could have underlying cancer as mm -hmm. the cause of their acute pancreatitis. So it's uh, a whole other list of etiologies comes into those folks. But I think it's the younger and the more attacks and the lack of any other obvious, you know, etiology that leads it. But it's quite variable, I would guess. Yeah. Well, thank you. And it sounds like there is a shift as we the pediatric literature is enriching more with genetic etiologies. We see some of the adult folks um, putting less on the idiopathic and really sending those when their other cause is not found. So there is that kind of shift as well. So Dr. Lowe, um, I had a question for what do you envision about the use of endoscopic ultrasound in pediatric acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis? Can you comment on where are we now and how do you see it being incorporated? Well, I, I think we're, we're still uh, uh, figuring that out. Um, clearly, uh, the, the most common use that I've seen in, in, in children, and if you look at what's been published, is uh, for therapeutic procedures. For instance, that cyst that I said would need to be drained. Most of the time now, that would be done using an endoscopic ultrasound guidance mm -hmm. um, to help locate the cyst and, and put the drains in, at least initially. Um, we haven't started most places. There are a few places that do more endoscopic ultrasounds than others. Uh, we haven't uh, started using it to uh, diagnose um, uh, chronic pancreatitis. And I think, as, as Dr. Forbonnick alluded, there are a lot of criteria involved, and, and those criteria are shifting. So I, it, you know, that, that makes you think there's nothing specific. Uh, the other time I see it used in kids, we do see kids who have masses in their pancreas. And so ultrasound can be helpful to both guide if you want to biopsy the mass or uh, to help define what it is. Um, we are seeing um, a little more use of uh, endoscopic ultrasound to diagnose gallstone disease. Um, there are examples where gallstones can be missed by other imaging modalities that are found by endoscopic ultrasounds. I've seen, I've seen that in kids. Um, so I think that uh, that we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but I, and, and as more um, uh, pediatric gastroenterologists, pancreatologists become uh, competent in, in doing endos endoscopic ultrasound, I think uh, that we'll, we'll see more of it and, and learn more. But I think it can be useful in selected patients, no question about it. Yeah, and definitely. Just from the adult side, I would just say one thing, and that is I was sort of other conditions that make the pancreas look funny on a endoscopic ultrasound. And at least in adults, if you're thinking about using it for chronic pancreatitis, I think my rule of thumb is, is never 
base a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis solely on an endoscopic ultrasound. You need corroborating information because you can really get fooled if you see a few minor changes in the pancreas and label that patient as having chronic pancreatitis without any other supporting evidence. Yeah, I would agree. I have seen um, uh, children who've had endoscopic ultrasounds uh, elsewhere and they've got, you know, some stranding or a couple things and they say, it says consistent with chronic pancreatitis. Um, so I, I, I agree. I, I think both in adults and kids, we're trying to, to, to figure out uh, the utility of endoscopic ultrasound uh, for the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis and whether it's helpful or not. Absolutely. We have to be very open to know that we don't know how um, to define the endpoints for what we're um, seeing right now. And some of it is subjective. I totally agree. And it's one of those things that we kind of have to use it with caution now until more data is available on what those terms mean, especially when you apply it in a, in a population that those criteria have not been validated on. So the children, we need to validate our own EUS criteria. I would finish with uh, one question that might summarize some of the other chat uh, comments uh, to Dr. Forsmark. Does pain and chronic pancreatitis ever wear out? So the, the reason I ask this is that I just uh, counseled the patient today about a total pancreatectomy autotransplant. And while the patient is 18, they have a full future ahead of them. Do you use that in your counseling to say, well, at this age, you are going to develop exocrine insufficiency from huge data sets and by the mid 20s to 30s diabetes and then the cancer risk is at a later age. Do you give them a hope that maybe it's just going to go away and how? I wish I could um, provide that, that hope or that prediction to identify which patients might experience pain relief. There definitely are some patients who get pain relief, you know, 10 or 20 years into their disease for reasons that I certainly don't understand, but it's, it's a very small fraction of patients. Um, many of them continue to have pain and they somehow learn to live with it a little more effectively, or sometimes they don't. But um, uh, I think if you are hoping that the pain is gonna burn out, you know, it's your chances are not very good that that's going to happen. So I don't include that and sort of give them a pie in the sky, you know, rosy yeah. Uh, yeah. picture. I mean, that, yeah, that used to be the uh, the teaching, right, Chris? Many, many yeah, years no, ago. No, many <laughs> textbooks. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, I always go back to a family I took care of uh, with hereditary pancreatitis. So mom carried the gene. She developed her first attack in her 30s. Her uh, son and daughter developed their first attack around four or five years of age. The son was in and out of the hospital constantly with pain up until about 13 or 14 years of age, and it slowed down and then stopped. Uh, the daughter uh, started getting admissions for pain in uh, her teens. So she went through her childhood doing well. So I think it's it really is an unpredictable course, and even in, in families with the same um, genetic defect, of course, they've got a lot of other genes that influence this, but but it can be, it's, it's quite variable. So I think it's dangerous to, to say, um, although I would agree that most, I think most patients continue to have pain. Yeah, now I, I agree with both of you and that's a common thing that where people want more genetic testing, you gotta know what to do with it. So having the genetic mutation does not mean you're gonna follow the same course that another family member has. So thank you. I, some, can I ask you a question? Yeah. When you do genetic testing on a kid and you find one of these uh, CFTR mutation and maybe Mark, so what is your experience with using some of the new uh, cystic fibrosis meds on kids that have relapsing pancreatitis? Do you have a sense that they work or any personal experience? So, so there are, there are, um, you know, this is a whole talk by itself, but um, to try to get to the answer quick, we, um, so the CFTR variants that are more than 2,500, not all of them have been studied for those CFTR correctors and modulators. So if they were studied and reported to respond, we may offer it if insurance covers it, of course, but um, what is the endpoint? Is it decreasing the recurrence of the attacks? Is it decreasing pain? So having end goals when it comes to pancreatic 
disease becomes hard because we're not going to go and measure the pH of the intestine. That would be ideal yeah. if we can do. It's not the same as having endpoints with the FEV1 of the lung function. You give the medication and you do that test monthly and you can define your outcome measures. There are even, it becomes more dicey if those variants have not been reported before under that class of medications. Then we take those intestinal cells to the lab and test them in vitro and test those medications. It's an intriguing question and field. Um, I wouldn't put a lot of promise on it. However, it sounds very promising because we know that defective CFTR function could increase the risk for acute recurrent or even chronic pancreatitis, especially if you add to it smoking and alcohol, which would suppress the CFTR function further. It's, um, it, it hasn't been well studied yet. Um, the the one report that suggested that there might be some optimism was a reanalysis of the original data using um, the CFTR correctors and the uh, patients with, C, uh, with cystic fibrosis. And there were, uh, I think, half a dozen patients in that group who'd had acute, acute recurrent pancreatitis. And so they were able to use them as historical controls and it suggested that they did better. Um, but as my, there, it, and, there has not been a controlled study uh, to look at it. And it's, it's a tough one um, because of uh, what Meissen said. I agree with her. The endpoint is, 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 is difficult. Most likely it's going to have to be episodes, but that's going to take a long time and to use their historical pattern versus um, uh, what happens when after you start the drug or do you compare everybody on average and because there's so much variability. So it's, it's not a straightforward study to design, I don't think. Yeah, again, because the pancreas is so retroperitoneal and out of reach. <laughs> so um, to be um, kind of thankful for everyone's time and to our uh, speakers, both, thank you for a very, very helpful and educational uh, lectures today. Um, and I thank all our attendees. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I would like to encourage you all to call in and be there for August 6th, so next Thursday for our third webinar, where we'll be covering pancreas cancer by our two speakers, Dr. Bahari and Dr. Amy Lucas. And um, hope you all have a great evening and good night and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.